Today, we're talking turf grass. Hey folks, welcome to the Shades of Green show. I'm Jarek, one of your hosts, and today I'm so excited because we're covering all things turf grass. So get ready, be sure to pause because the slides our guest speaker has have a ton of amazing information. And so let's get things rolling and introduce our special guest. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so happy to welcome our guest. Please, everybody put your hands together for Dr. Becky Grubbs Bowling. Is it Dr. Becky or Dr. Rebecca? What do you prefer? Dr. Becky is great. Okay, perfect. Dr. Becky, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I've, I've used all your information. I've learned from your classes to our customers. And I'm so glad to have you here with us to give uh, all your knowledge and share. So uh, let the people know a little about who you are, uh, what's your role um, in AgriLife and all the fun stuff. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a native Texan. I grew up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area right. and uh, I did my undergrad and my master's in horticulture at Texas Tech. And then I did a PhD at the University of Georgia. I started with Texas a and in 2018, actually as a turf grass extension specialist in College Station. And then I actually moved up to Dallas uh, about a year and a half ago to assume a new role um, with our new urban water program at the Dallas Center. So I do all things landscape water related here in Dallas, and I'm helping to build our really exciting new program. Um, as an extension specialist, I get to do a lot of uh, public speaking, a lot of outreach and engagement a lot of training of green industry professionals as well as homeowners. So I'm really excited to be here today. Awesome. Well, we're so glad. And, you know, you're probably off seeing that new Coit Road location, the new facility. It looks incredible over there. Uh, we'll talk later about maybe some of the stuff you have going on with programs and everything. And um, maybe some of our customers can actually take classes there and get to see you speak in person, which I highly encourage. Um, and so let's dive right in. So you have a history in turf grass, which is a huge problem here. We're gonna kind of focus on that turf grass and the water conservation aspect with the focus being on lawns and stuff. Cause right now, especially in fall, people are doing their fall fertilizing, the pre-emergence and people come with questions. And um, really, I just wanna kind of dive in, I guess at the beginning is before they get to all that, one key is just kind of turf grass selection. Uh, so what are some of your favorites? Let's break down some different types. What should people be thinking of when they're trying to get turf grass? Um, all those fun things. Yeah, this is a great question. It's a great starting point too, because much like with any plant we bring into the landscape, it's all about right plant, right place, right? So we need to choose the right turf grass starting off to really have a successful lawn area. So um, when we are selecting a turf, there's a lot of things we may be focused on. People tend to get really hung up on the looks part of it, but we also need to make sure that that turf grass is functional and that it's resource efficient, which means that um, it's the right fit for the amount of light water, soil, um, everything that we have that's unique to our landscape. Now here in Texas, most of the time, we are actually gonna be using warm season grasses. So if you're a recent transplant, you've come from another part of the country, the North, the Midwest, these may be fairly new to you. Uh, warm season grasses are gonna include things like Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass, zoysia grass, all very common here in North Texas. Um, we also may occasionally see some cool season grasses like rye grasses and fescues. Um, as you can see, they have very different growth habits. So warm season grasses in general are going to be better suited to Texas climates unless we're up in the panhandle or out in far west Texas. As you can see there, if we look at these side by side, warm season grasses, we typically see that ideal temperature range for growth at 80 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas many of our cool season grasses are growing at 60 to 75. So that may be like two weeks of the year, depending on where we are in yeah. Texas. <laughs> we also know that warm season grasses tend to be more water use efficient. They have more drought resistance. So they just tend to be a better fit for our hot, dry Texas summers that we have. So if we look at these side by side, um, we have actually over 700 species of grasses here in Texas, but only about 14 or 15 of these we see used for turf grass. Um, so there on the left, you'll see a lot of those warm season grasses you may be especially familiar with. Um, on the right there again, some of those cool season grasses we may see occasionally as well. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about four in particular that we tend to see um, in, in this part of Texas, which is going to be Bermuda grass, buffalo grass, St. Augustine grass, and zoysia grass. So um, as you can see there, looking at these side by side, there are some differences in light requirement. Many of you probably know that St. Augustine is going to be one of the more shade tolerant options if you've got some big trees. 
but that doesn't mean it's going to grow in the dark. And so it still needs about five to six hours of light a day minimum to really do well. We I do can hear the- just hearts breaking at that news <laughs> of like, oh no, I want something in full shade. And they just get set on it. So my customers yeah. listen to what Dr. Becky is saying, folks. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Unfortunately, still need a, enough light to support healthy growth. And um, we do have some zoysia grasses that also do very well, actually, in partial to a moderate shade, um, especially some of our fine textured zoysia grasses, but they can come with some unique management challenges. So make sure you do your research before you uh, pick one of those out. And they usually need a little bit more attention as it relates to mowing and cultivation or dethatching. Um, Bermuda and buffalo grass are going to both be uh, nice full sun options for lawns where we have some limited water. In fact, buffalo grass, we want to discourage you from watering it too much. It can really t- uh, actually have some negative uh, implications for the health of that grass. And so um, a lot of good options here. We do see a lot of differences in how these perform under conditions of drought by species. So our buffalo grass, which is a native grass option, is going to typically be the most drought resistant but it's going to also be kind of a prairie grass. It's going to have a little different look and feel to it. Some people may or may not be ready for that. Um, Some people really like that nice, tight, clean look that we get from some of these other species. And so if you're, you know, putting in a native grass, you've got to have a little bit different expectation for how it's going to look and perform, allow it to be a little bit taller, longer. Um, You can kind of see as we go up and down there, uh, some of our more drought resistant options at the top, Now we do have St. Augustine is more of a more moderate water user, but I am gonna have some exciting news about that here in a minute. So just to kind of keep you guys uh, in the know on some of the newest varieties of grasses that we have available. And we actually have a multi-million dollar USDA project active right now with six different universities in the country focused on breeding new drought resistant warm season turf grasses. So a lot of advancement in that area with grasses that are specifically designed to root deeper and really perform well under drought conditions. Um, And uh, as a result of that, we've got three Bermuda grasses here that have come out in recent years between that effort and just normal breeding efforts at Oklahoma State and the University of Georgia. All of these are available here in the state of Texas. If you're interested in them, you just need to do a little research to find uh, the grower near you that's producing these or work with a good landscape contractor that's going to be familiar with where to get these. Um, So we have Tip Tough there at the top probably the most drought tolerant of these options out of the University of Georgia breeding program. Uh, Really nice performer. There at the bottom, Latitude 36 and Tahoma 31. Those two are both Oklahoma State grasses and they offer some good drought performance, but they also have some nice uh, fall color, early spring color, um, nice, dense, attractive uh, canopy to them. All three of these, you can see if you're a big college football fan and you want to see how they look uh, in a big college uh, football field, um, you're going to be able to see Tiff Tough on the University of Georgia football field, Latitude 36 on that A&M field, Kyle field, and Tahoma 31 you can see on the uh, University of Arkansas field. So if you're curious about those. That's awesome. I didn't know they were getting some college tie-ins too. I guess it makes sense, the research institution using it. And like, what's the, from the invention or creation or breeding of this new grass to retail trade, like, are these easily accessible? Or like, does it take some growers some time to get on the, get on the new gravy train or what's, what's that? Yeah, like? it takes about 15 to 20 years to go from wow. nothing to a commercially available new cultivar of turf grass. And yes, growers are heavily involved in that process. So uh, our breeding program here at Texas A&M, which is focused on Zoysia and St. Augustine, we have growers that come out multiple times a year to look at experimental grasses that are just in those early stages and they get to provide input the whole way through. Um, And so what we see when a, a new cultivar is released is they're actually patented. And for the first 20 years, they only a licensed grower can grow and produce that cultivar. Um, They have to be monitored and undergo special regulations to ensure the purity, the cleanliness of that turf grass. So when you get one of these new cultivars, you're paying a little extra, but it's for a reason. You're getting a really high quality uh, uh, material. Yeah. Um, So like I said, and then we, we focus more on uh, Zoysia St. Augustine. We do have a couple of new Zoysias that are out and more to come in, in a few years 
ahead of uh, a few years forward, we'll have more options. But um, newest release from Texas A&M is going to be Innovation Zoysia Grass. It's a collaboration with Kansas State. It's really its strength is going to be one, its appearance. It's got a really pretty intermediate texture. So it's not super fine. It's not super coarse and um, really nice look to it. Um, and two, it's going to offer some excellent cold tolerance. Um, so compared to some other zoysias that are out there with that intermediate texture, that's going to be a real strength. And then probably not for the average homeowner, but I thought you guys might be interested to know that uh, there are also a lot of new zoysias being used for putting green surfaces. So that's kind of a new emergent trend. If you're a golfer, you're into that. There might be some changes in terms of what you're seeing on the putting greens here in the next few years. Yeah. Make the greens a little faster would help my golf game probably. So, yeah. uh, you know, in the PGA, they're bringing their complex to Frisco. So I'm sure a lot of people are very interested in the new grass types that's going to be played on that course out there. Well, um, you know, my husband is actually the superintendent for the short course and practice facilities at the new course really? there in Frisco. Yes. Okay. And so so I, I need to meet him and we need to <laughs> just form a connection. I'd love to That's just right. you know, get to know him, talk to him, and then maybe take a tour or two, you know? Yeah. And I can tell you for sure that in those, in that short course and practice facility area, that's the most accessible to the public that we will have a lot of these new zoysia innovations that are out there. These new greens type zoysias will be out there um, in that part of the facility. So people will be able to definitely see those there on that new PGA Frisco course. Very exciting. Awesome. I love it. Who knows we're going to be talking about golf here in the middle of the <laughs> turf grass talk, but here we go. <laughs> All right. Another thing that's just on the horizon that we're really excited about is uh, a brand new St. Augustine. So new, we have not even named it yet. So we're still calling it by its experimental number, which is 1618. And this one we can probably anticipate will start being available in 2023. Uh, and this one is going to be very drought resistant compared to what's on the market right now. So we are seeing that it uses about 60 to 80% less water than the other commercially available St. Augustines that are out there. Wow. It's actually been really competitive with Bermuda grass in certain trials. And so we're really optimistic that this is going to completely change the game for St. Augustine grasses. So we'll have this coming out as well as uh, Scott's company will also be releasing one um, that A&M was involved in called Provista St. Augustine. So a couple new St. Augustine options, okay. hopefully on the horizon. Yes. And in those new breeds, are they losing their kind of shade tolerance at all? They still have that shade tolerance in the five hours minimum. That's Great. right. The, the, the shade tolerance is always a priority with St. Augustine grass. So we're looking to take that and enhance it further by bringing in that really strong drought resistance. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. So a question that I get a lot is about alternatives for turf grass, particularly for those really heavily shaded areas where we just are not able to grow St. Augustine anymore. It does happen. And I will tell you that one thing that we see too, is that it's not always just about the lighting. Sometimes it's also about physical space and the fact that we have a lot of live oaks, for example, in many parts of the state, they're shallow rooted trees. This can create its own challenges sometimes. So sometimes you know, one thing that we may do is just expand our mulch ring, may not try to grow things depending on how dense the shade is. Um, the other thing we can do is look for some alternative ground covers that um, also do fairly well um, in those heavily shaded environments. So um, things like creeping juniper, green santalina, gray santalina, creeping phlox, uh, dichondra, which some people think of as a weed, but you know, sometimes we think of it as a weed because it does really well in environments where our turf grass doesn't. Um, uh, mint, purple winter creeper, and snake herb are also options. And then for a little bit denser shade, we can do some things like frog fruit, which I actually really love frog fruit. Mm -hmm. It's got a really cute little flower on it. It's native. It does pretty well in those shaded areas. Um, bugleweed is also one that's very popular. It's what you'll see in this uh, upper left-hand picture here. Very cute little purple plant um, with some nice flowers on it too. Uh, we could go for a green oxalis. We could go for horse herb. Again, one sometimes people think of as a weed, but again, it's a native. It works. It well in certain systems. That's right. Um, lamium and uh, purple oxalis. So we do have other options um, to explore and look at when this comes up. For That's sure. great. And folks, you can buy all those at Shades of Green. We have all those, uh, especially the horse herb. We actually planted a bunch of horse herb. We have a, a native, just a natural creek running through our property. So we just had a lot of erosion issues. Plant horse herb, it's taking off and doing awesome. And just the shadiness of the creek uh, bank. Uh, it's really awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, so, so those are, sorry, what'd you say? 
I said, that's what I've got for selection. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So we're cruising through here. So selection is key. Again, don't get your hopes up that you're going to have a putting green. If you have full shade, it's just not going to happen. You may want to go with a synthetic approach, but, um, uh, once they have this weed, they have the selection. What does some of the care look like coming into it? Cause weeds, even the ones we don't like come on up. Um, there's all kinds of different approaches to tackle that. And I know that's a really broad question, but what are just some of the basics that a, a customer should be thinking through when they're dealing with, okay, I got this great lawn. What do I do now? Yeah. So, um, you know, in terms of basic management practices, there's a number of things that we want to focus on. Um, so definitely mowing is going to be a great place to start. So making sure that you are, uh, are in the right same state of mind as it relates to your mowing height. So we see a lot of times people try to mow St. Augustine too short, for example. People try to mow buffalo grass too short. Um, people may try to uh, mow zoysia too tall. So we wanna do some research and really look at what is the species, what is the variety of grass that I have, and what is the appropriate mowing height. And we actually do have some resources um, with Texas A&M on our Aggie Turf website. We have a okay. mowing guide that includes a table with mowing heights for some of our most common species. So that's going to be a really good place to start. Um, another good place to start is going to be mowing frequency, which is where a lot of people tend to maybe not do things the right way. Slack a off a little times. bit, you know. <laughs> you can say yeah, it. We, we're forgetful mowers sometimes. It's okay. Yeah, a lot of times we like to go out as infrequently as possible. We also may mow as short as possible. And unfortunately, this is just some of the worst um, these are some of the worst things that we can do for our lawn. Uh, we really want to try to um, follow something that's called the one third rule. So that's going to be this idea that every time we go out, we should only be removing about one third of that total green canopy height at one time. And that's going to help ensure that we don't scalp that turf grass. You know, if, if you guys take nothing else away from this today, please take away the fact that we really, really, really want to encourage deep roots in our turf grass lawn. And when we scalp our turf, we actually cause the plant to take reserves out of those roots and we lose a lot of that good root growth. Mm -hmm. So mowing frequently, keeping the appropriate mowing height is a great place to start. Now, if we wanted to talk a little bit more about weeds, let me get some slides up here. I'd love to talk about this because these are probably about, I would say 80% of the questions that we get um, as extension specialists or about how do like I- Like a little baggie them. with something. Hey, what's this? You know, we get the baggies yeah. too. We love them. <laughs> it's been in their car eight hours and it's kind of- That's scribbled. right. Kind of backtrack and figure it out. Yeah. So let's talk about this for just a little bit. So the first thing is, you know, we do want to start with good weed identification. If you have a lot of issues with weeds in your yard, we want to try to get a sense of what weeds are they and what does this mean in terms of how can I change my management approach or how can I choose the right herbicides if that's the approach that I want to take to try to control those weeds. Or even if you're, you're trying to use mechanical control, you know, you're not really a fan of herbicides, you want to pull weeds, it's still really good to know. You know, we get a lot of people that um, have issues with nuts sedge mm -hmm. and they go out and they try to yank those nut sedge plants right up. And then they say, oh, no matter how many times they pull, they come right back up. And it's because nut sedge actually produces tubers in the soil. So if we don't take a little hand trowel, trowel in there and dig those tubers up, every time we pull those leaves out, it just regrows from those tubers. So it's mm -hmm. good to know about the weeds that you're dealing with. And so thinking about, am I dealing with grassy weeds or broadleaf weeds? Am I dealing with annuals, perennials, biennials? You know, all of those terms that we hear with our desirable plants, they also apply to weeds. And so depending on whether or not we're dealing with an annual or perennial, it's going to make our, our whole approach more or less challenging. Now, um, let's see, I'm going to kind of skip ahead here. So when we are looking at identification, we do want to try to identify specifically, am I dealing with something that's more grassy or sedge like, or am I dealing with a broadleaf weed? Um, one of the easiest ways that people can differentiate between the two is to look at the veins on the leaf. So as you can see here on the right, we have, this is what's called parallel venations. They look like little stripes. Um, so this is a good sign that I'm dealing with grasses or sedges. If my veins look more like these first two photos here, 
where we have netted venation, this is a good sign that I'm dealing with broadleaf weeds. Now, every herbicide product that we choose is gonna be more effective on certain types of weeds. And very often we'll see a division between products that are meant for grassy weeds or sedges and products that are meant for broadleaf weeds. So it's really important that we pay attention to this. Every year um, I get folks that are using just completely the wrong type of herbicide for the weeds that they have. And so it's just a waste of time, a waste of money. Mm -hmm. just kind of spray and see if something sticks and it's just not the right approach whenever you're that's right applying that's products right. to your lawn yeah and then um let's talk a little bit too about um this integrated weed management idea so a lot of times you know we get folks that do get really hung up on the herbicide question but when we really want to have effective weed control in our landscape areas we want to be really holistic in our approach and so usually i like to talk about five main methods of control. One of these is going to be preventative control. This is just being really smart and really careful about the things that we bring into our landscape, you know, recognizing that every time we mulch, compost, bring new seed or sod in, these are things that have the potential to be contaminated and cause a problem for us. So we really want to try to be mindful of that, try to get really high quality material. Good cultural control is going to include some of the mowing we talked about. It's also going to include appropriate irrigation, which I think we're going to talk about here in a little bit more, some good water conserving tips for our landscape. Mm -hmm. And so we'll go over some of that um, appropriate fertilization, which I always say starts with a soil test, get your soil tested. You really want to know what your soil and your lawn and landscape need. That's where you should start. We really want to try to avoid guessing when it comes to nutrient management. Mechanical control, again, is um, pulling weeds by hand, creating physical barriers, mulch in your landscape beds can make a big difference. It won't stop every weed, but it'll stop a lot of them. And so why not have it there? It also helps to conserve water in our landscape too. Um, biological control, uh, we don't see as much of this yet in many of our home lawn scenarios, but it is an emerging area. So we may have more options in years to come where we've got certain bacterial species that we can utilize um, to help control weeds in our landscape. If you have backyard chickens or guineas, that can be a form of biological control there as well. <laughs> and then of course we have all of our herbicides, um, including our pre and post emergence, our systemic and contact herbicides. Um, so we want to try to have a plan that includes all of these different pieces when we're thinking about weeds in the landscape. We want to try to think about how do we keep things balanced. Everything we do in the landscape can have implications for the health of our turf and the types of weeds that we see, whether I'm overwatering, underwatering, over fertilizing, under fertilizing, all of this can impact weed pressure in my yard. Yeah, and it seems like a good balance. And looking at all these, and you're I can see so much be like, uh, this seems like a lot, but it really is, you know take notes, come talk to us at Shades of Green, come to y'all's classes, you do some research. And it's not a, you may be doing most of the stuff already, you just don't know it. And it's just kind of paying more attention to it rather than creating this huge detailed program like you are, your husband managing a golf course. You don't have to do that <laughs> for your own true. yard. But no. it's just a little bit of effort and kind of education can go a long way in preventing maybe even having to use herbicides at all. You never know. So Exactly. You know, what I always tell people is the best defense against weeds is healthy turf grass. So when we have a really severe weed problem, it usually means that there's something that we could change very simply about how we're managing our turf to help it be more competitive, especially if you've got a St. Augustine or a Zoysia lawn. Those are grasses that are so dense and so thick. We never use herbicides in our St. Augustine lawn and we never have weed issues. We just focus on keeping the grass healthy and it does a great job of taking care of the weeds for us. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I know the big topic that everybody always wonders about, especially in the city of Frisco, they do a great job on being very irrigation water conscious, which I love um, is the irrigation component, which is a large step, but not necessarily one that is used appropriately all the time. So let's dive into a little bit about what are some water conservation strategies? We talked about selection, but once we have it selected, what are some of those steps that we can still have that nice golf course type feel without the golf course type water bill at the end of the month? Yeah. So when we're talking about this, I like to always start off by talking about what are some of the most common problems that we see or mistakes that we see related to irrigation. And then I'll share some really basic tips that you can try to bring into your water management program. 
The other thing that I'll mention about this briefly, you know, we talked about rooting, um, soil management, soil preparation, really, really important when it comes to having a healthy water efficient yard. And unfortunately the soil often gets overlooked. We often see people that plant brand new sod on top of old dead sod. They don't take any time to care for the soil. And so just like we would if we were getting a potted plant and preparing to put it in our landscape, we want to take time to prepare the soil for really good, healthy rooting. So that's a great place to start. Maybe some light tillage. You can even incorporate compost, just like we would when we're planting anything else in our yard. And, and, and our lawn loves that. Now, once we've kind of got that situated, we've planted our new turf, we're moving forward. We do want to think about what are some of these common issues. First and foremost, we get a lot of folks that overwater. They just flat out overestimate how much their turf grass needs. And so we see people that water every single day. We see people that are watering five days a week. We see people watering all through the winter. And so we want to be really judicious about how much we're actually watering. And we'll actually talk about this in a little bit more detail here in a second. We also will sometimes see issues with the design and installation of an irrigation system. And, you know, depending on where you are, you may be in an older, more established neighborhood where you know absolutely nothing about how your system was installed initially and who's been working on it over the past couple of decades and what they've done. And so thinking about that as well is really important. We see a lot of issues sometimes with irrigation systems just not being programmed correctly. So wrong time of day, wrong time of year, wrong frequency and duration. You know, we see a lot of times here that um, we may not even be the ones that programmed our irrigation system. We may see a builder do that, or, you know, somebody else has done that before us and we just leave it as it is. And we have no idea if that's really the right approach for watering or not. So that's something we wanna check into as well. And then a lot of times we see that there's just no real plan for just basic routine maintenance. And so these are all things that we wanna kind of think about. Now, in terms of some basic tips, here's some, here's some of the main things we need to know. One, and this is counterintuitive for a lot of people, we actually wanna focus on watering deeply and infrequently especially as it relates to our lawn. So actually if we're watering every single day, we're just doing that little spritz every single day, that's actually harmful to our turf grass system. A lot of times it encourages a very codependent turf grass baby. So we're out there having to feed it every single day. It's just waiting for us to show up. It never has any motivation to produce those deep, healthy roots. Mm. Now, if I go out and I water very, very deeply and I allow that to dry down, what part of that's gonna dry down first? Yeah, the top part. The top, the top, right? And so as that top starts to dry down, what's going to happen to my roots is they're going to reach for that water deeper in the soil. And it's going to encourage that deeper root growth that I'm really looking for. So deep and infrequent typically do not need to irrigate more than one to two times per week, even during the summer, as long as we have everything set up for that water to move deeply. As much as possible in the landscape, we want to try to keep water close to the roots. My motto is low and slow. So in your landscape beds, using drip irrigation, soaker hoses where you can, we are seeing an increase in subsurface drip irrigation and turf grass systems. And there are some challenges that can come with that from a management standpoint. But even if you are using uh, an in-ground irrigation system with pop-up sprinklers, one thing that you can do is if you've got the spray nozzles, you can swap those out for a, a rotary nozzle or a multi-stream rotor. It's going to put that water out at a little bit slower, lower pressure, heavier. So more of it's going to come into contact with your lawn, less of it's going to be lost to wind or evaporation. We do have a lot of challenging soils uh, in Texas, all throughout Texas. We've got steep slopes, really heavy clay soils that can get compacted. So that can make it challenging to get water to move deeply. So one thing that we might really try to do is program our irrigation system to cycle and soak. So this idea that we're pulsing water into the soil more gradually, so if I do a catch can audit and I know that to put out half an inch of water, which may be my goal for the week, I need to run each zone for 30 minutes. Well, maybe I know that if I turn my system on and I run a zone for 30 minutes after the first 10 minutes, it's just running off into the street. So instead of running that 30 minutes all at one, at one time, I may program my system to do three times for 10 minutes and have a 30 to 60 minute rest in between. So this just gives that water time to really soak in at a more gradual rate so that I'm not having as much of that runoff. It allows the water to go a lot uh, more deeply into the soil. And so 
Uh, many of our new irrigation systems actually will have a way for you to do this pretty easily. But even if you have an older one, my suggestion is go to the manufacturer website, look and see if they've got some tips for how to program those older systems. Check out YouTube as well. See what resources are on there to, to show you how to do this. We also want to have a plan for monitoring our irrigation system closely. You know, a lot of times we run our irrigation when we're sleeping or we're not outside. And so we may not realize there's a problem until it's too late. So try to check in at least once a month with your system, um, put it on that two minute cycle, make sure everything is running smoothly. Some things are really obvious, like a, a nozzle that, or a head that's shooting 20 feet in the air. Yeah. <laughs> Some Backed things. over it, going down the driveway. May yeah. happen in our house. Don't, don't, don't want to talk about it. Exactly. Some things may be less obvious. You know, we may have a clogged nozzle or we may have a head that's under rotating or we may have a subsurface leak. And so it just feels like a weird, squishy, wet spot in our soil. And so those are things we definitely want to pay attention to for sure. Now is one thing I do like to share with folks is that they may not be aware of is that here in the state of Texas, irrigation repair work, irrigation auditing, any formal work done on irrigation systems is actually regulated. And so if you hire somebody to do work on your irrigation system, you want to make sure that they're licensed by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, so the TCEQ. And you can actually go to the TCEQ website and search for licensed irrigators in your area. You can look up your uh, ir licensed irrigator by name in their system. So you just want to make sure that anyone that you're paying to work on your system or consult on your system um, is licensed and covered so you can make sure everything is done appropriately. Yeah, that's great. City of Frisco actually has free sprinkler audits for residents in Frisco. So they're really pushing that. So you can always check their website. I don't know what it is, but for that free sprinkler check um, and they're all on that Texas registry. So yeah, and we see that in many parts of the Metroplex. We actually have a number of different um, cities and stakeholder groups, water districts that'll offer those types of services. So definitely poke awesome. around see what you can find um, to get some help with that. Um, we do want to focus on watering in the early morning hours when possible. So most of us know by now that watering in the middle of the day is a big no-no, right? We have a lot of evaporative losses. It's just not efficient. It's a, it can be very wasteful. Um, but we do still see a lot of people that water in the evenings. Um, now, the downside to this is that we may increase the risk of disease in our lawn and landscape areas because we're keeping those leaves wet overnight. Um, and so Early morning watering allows us to be really efficient with putting that water out and also reduces the amount of time that that water sits on the leaf. So it makes it to where our plant is less susceptible to certain diseases, especially during those spring and fall periods when our temperatures are just perfect for certain diseases to be active. You know, this time of year, we're starting to worry about large patch disease. So if you have St. Augustine or zoysia grass lawn in particular, and you've had a history of dealing with that disease, and, and some of you may refer to it as brown patch disease, but, but when, with warm season grass, we call it large patch. Um, one thing that can really help prevent that is to focus on early morning watering, scale back that evening watering, cut it out of your program so that you're keeping that moisture off your leaves overnight. Um, I do get a question sometimes about how much to water. So as a general rule of thumb um, here in North Texas, we typically never need to water more than half an inch to an inch of water per week to make up for evapotransportive losses or the losses that we have from the plant, from the soil as a result of all of our weather conditions. And of course, when we go through periods of rainfall, we typically will do even less than this because we need to adjust based on what nature is already providing us. Now, one resource that can be very helpful for this that we have throughout the Metroplex is the Water My Yard program. So it's just watermyyard.org. You can sign up on their website to get weekly emails or text messages that'll help tell you exactly how much you need to water on a weekly basis based on the type of weather, weather that we're getting. So it can be a really, really helpful tool. Um, strongly encourage you to check it out. Now, in order to do that, we have to know how, how long to run our system to put out a certain number of inches, right? And a lot of us may not know that, but that's where, again, having some help with somebody auditing our system or even doing a catch can test ourselves, where we just take some tuna fish cans, set them out in each of our little irrigation zones, run our system for 15 minutes, and we can see, okay, how long do I need to run my system to put out half an inch to an inch of water per week? Um, and there are a lot of great resources online and videos to walk you through that process. 
Awesome. Well, this was a whirlwind and it was so much information. It was so perfect for what uh, we needed here today. So thank you so much for um, your time, energy to get this together for us and come let our customers know what's going on. And I'm sure now they're going to want to know more. How can they follow along you, what you're doing with your research, your programs and any events you want to plug? What do you got for us now? Yeah, so sure, it's probably a little short notice, but we do have our turf grass and landscape field day here at the Dallas Center on October 6th. We do it every October. So if you miss it this year, we'll have it in future years. And um, you can contact me. Um, I'll share my email. It's Rebecca.grubs my maiden name at ag.tamu.edu is my what new a pest email. for your turf grass lady grubs is the last name. I love it. <laughs> I know. Yep. So, um, you can feel free to contact me. We can get you on the list sir, for that. Um, you can also follow me. My uh, Twitter handle is TX water woman, Texas water woman. I so like feel free it. To follow me I there. Like it. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, we do have our center here on Coit road. Um, it's not, always open to the public. You're welcome to come by and at least see our gardens and everything else. But if you work for a, uh, if you're with a group, if you're with master gardeners or something like that, you're interested in a tour, just contact me and we can try to set that up. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for doing this. This was uh, a privilege just to get to talk to you and um, get your feedback and share it all with my customers. Cause I'm just really just regurgitating what I've learned in your classes to my customers. So now they get to hear it firsthand which is great for them. And uh, thank you all guys for tuning in to the Shades of Green show. Again, Dr. Becky Grubbs Bowling, we're so happy to have you and we'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.